Hey man, welcome back from the mountain, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much. They, and and from from ski gear to a suit and tie. Yeah, many, <laughs> many, the many faces of Andy. Fantastic. <laughs> right. So at this point, I leave the word to you guys. I know you have a lot to discuss, and we have Olga Sommer from Nobud Hotel London. She will make some question, some interesting to get to know more about info in general. So yes. let's listen to your in conversation, guys. I'm here, and uh, I'll leave the words to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Hansa. Um, Andrew, good afternoon, Andrew. Thank you very much for your time. It's a great pleasure to, um, to have a conversation with you and hoping to learn a little bit from you right now. Um, so you, you coming, you. you're coming with, thank you. You're coming from wealth of experience working, having worked in revenue field for a number of years for different hotels and hotel groups. And you also work right now for the Infor offering um, technical solutions for a number of industries, including hospitality. So you, you know, all the kind of pain points we have, but also you have solutions or, or to our problems or day-to-day -day challenges. So I would like to start a conversation by asking can you how do you envision the role of brand agnostics and OTAs, um, how hoteliers can utilize them in the strategies uh, moving forward? Yes, yes, and thank you. And uh, you're you're correct. I I have a I bring a certain bias, um, having worked as a as a director of revenue, and I've <laughs> seen that it's it's paid off in terms of touchstones. But um, thank you for the question, specifically as it relates to the online travel agencies and the brand agnostics. Um, needless to say, this this channel, these channels have um, changed pretty considerably um, in the last 15 months, um, our relative uh, dependence on them. And what some hotels had employed up to that point as either a filler or a stabilizer to sort of complement the occupancy of the house or the composition of the house has become a primary foundation um, of getting to a certain occupancy level. Um, there, as we know, have been special agreements and special ad hocs from providers uh, that have been introduced in the last year and a half as it relates to margin um, and deployment, all with an eye towards, um, from my perspective, trying to capitalize on that need for um, short-term occupancy. Um, and specifically hotels in, in urban areas and destination areas used that brand agnostic channel, that online travel agent channel, to help offset the tremendous deficit uh, that we were seeing as far as group room nights goes, um, but also with a presumptive backfill um, for the business travel. And things are changing. Um, every, every trend, as we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, is pointing towards a return, uh, I don't want to say to, to normalcy, but to stabilization. Um, and I, 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 I prognosticate that the you know, first back will be the midweek business travel and ideally social catering and larger group programs. And a rising tide will lift all ships. And most specifically, once hotels have the option to um, optimize their rate, uh, specifically in their commoditized product, their sweet product, um, this, should, this should change. Um, I urge the evolution of this channel um, to be used less as a crutch uh, to a tool, which is to say, get creative and strategic, right? On the opaque channels, uh, for example and perhaps deploy a longer length of stay in order to, uh, to layer in that occupancy. Uh, continue to target your need dates uh, with specials and value adds and make your market manager a partner. Um, you know, they have a vested interest, particularly based upon margin and deployment in your success um, as far as the hotel goes. You know, ultimately the directors of revenue management in the hotels have a fiduciary responsibility to manage channel costs. And directors of revenue should be very mindful um, of parting with margins, you know, when in merit necessary, but also be pragmatic um, and fence this. And the last thought on this is to sort of keep an eye on the ancillary spend um, for these guests. Um, you know, obviously we have a responsibility to edify not just uh, the rooms department, but the outlets, the spa, um, the, the, the contributory um, parts of, of the hotel. You do this as a base. Um, as you continue to build your strategy, but not as a significant portion of your overall segmentation plan. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Very good answer. Thank you very much. Um, interestingly, you kind of uh, note, noted that um, there is a recovery or green shoots of recovery are showing. I agree with you. We're seeing this in the UK as well. I think US is ahead of us. Um, kind of what is your base case scenario? It's a million dollar question. When do you think there will be um, 
time to, you know, we'll see civilization a little bit more going back to not pre-pandemic levels, but when do you think the world that, you know, recovery will, will happen? And probably um, you're seeing, I would imagine, seeing different trends by the region as well or the type of business. Um, yes. So what is your basic scenario? What are the trends that you're seeing? Well, it's it's the million dollar question and, and you know, definitely the, the magic bullet. And I'll, I'll anecdotally um, in the luxury segment, we were fortunate to have seen um, double digit leisure rate growth percentage uh, for the two years ending at the end of 2019. And demand was soaring um, in terms of, of, of all facets, whether it was the group side, the social catering side, the business travel and the all uh, precious leisure travel. Um, well, it's safe to say um, that we have seen and passed the point of bottoming out, if you will. Um, from my perspective, the return to stabilization is a way off. So we have we have two sort of key critical measures of performance here. You know, not only do we have to recover what was lost, you know, obviously adjusting for capacity, the true success is going to be um, indexing against those metrics and getting better. Now, uh, the United States saw for the week ending May 22nd, the highest occupancy since pre-pandemic, and I fully expect this to continue. Um, as you as you alluded to, there are, are certain touchstones, there are certain indicators that suggest that the infrastructure and the labor and the most specifically the air travel is coming back. All those obviously are contributory um, to getting us back to a, to a stabilization. Um, make no mistake about it, we're still in a book now, please mentality, uh, which is to say in some cases we we're willing to forsake a little bit of rate in order to get occupancy, um, but once the interference, rate should as well. Um, Complemented by feeder market air service into all destinations, again, whether it's a gateway city here in the US or a secondary tertiary market and the important return of group. My best case scenario is a return um, to where we were at the end of 2019 by the end of 2022. Now, the future after that is foggy. Um, the United States is forecasted to, to add about 250,000 new hotel rooms in the market between now and the end of 2022. So it's unclear, you know, as to the effect that this will have on markets that are ramping up, starting over uh, versus stabilized. Yeah, absolutely. Um now, interesting, we have seen also that maybe because I work right now in the luxury market, we're seeing increase of direct bu of business um, and also growth in um, uptake on the suite. So there is the uptake, you know, there is less maybe focus on the rate, uh, but more on, a, on the on the value and experiences. So um, it's interesting that you're saying that some hotels have been using OTAs to kind of to, to right now to plug the gap. but. Also, hotels have been reporting the increase of direct business since the beginning of the pandemic. So it could be a really good opportunity to try to capture that more direct business and keep the customers as returning customers. So um, do you think that there will be, there is right now a good time to do that, focus more on direct channels? Um, and do you see the same trends possibly increase in, in direct business in US or it's maybe just for the specific segments? Right. And it's, it's a great question. And, and again, coming from a similar background, um, those those leisure guests are our are, are, are greatest commodity, you know, as a, as a complement to the overall mm. strategy, our stocks, our stocks and trade. Because, as you know, that from a from a from a performance perspective, from a star perspective, um, rate through through the ARI has got a tremendous opportunity to take up our rev. Yeah. So absolutely. I would strongly advocate continuing to treat um, those direct bookers, whether they're booking from brand.com or through the voice channel, uh, as a most treasured commodity. Um, and so how do we get there? Uh, I would say continued flexibility um, in cancellation and change rules. Um, even if you're operating in a very seasonal business model, uh, be mindful of that. You know, I mean, obviously, the, the the anecdotal reasons for cancellation and for changes are completely different now than they were two years ago. Um, and a consistent focus on that leisure segment's gratitude and happiness. Um, continue to invest in your search engine optimization. Um, get creative um, with promotions and packages and keep a close eye on those TripAdvisor reviews. Um, get on there immediately and respond. And remember, 
one of the key indicators, at least in my background, pre-pandemic, was that nearly 70% of guests that ultimately decided to book on your hotel website or who called the hotel went to an online travel site or a review site first. Um, so they are important. And it's a little scarified in terms of the of the, the attention and the impressions that those sites are getting, but they still are ex extremely important. Um, keep current guests happy. Uh, be attentive is safe, obviously, being penultimate uh, consideration. And always, always offer uh, to book their next stay when they depart from their yeah. current one. Um, guests right. obviously are still operating with a, an incredible modicum of discretion, of hesitancy, and it's incumbent upon us to make things as easy for them as possible. Um, you know, do that and they will continue to reward not only with repeat patronage, but mitigated channel costs. You know, the cost per acquisition and the, the channel cost, as we all know, um, is extremely attractive from a direct booking perspective. Yeah, we'll come back to the question of, of the channel cost. Um, sure. Do you think in, the, in a post-pandemic uh, era, will we see um, the, the instinct play a still significant role in revenue management, or do you think we will be moving towards more data-driven analytics and, and strictly just data-driven based decisions? Um, I am, that, that's, that is an easy one. I would say in short, no. Um, you know, we're, we're through the looking glass. Um, and if there, was, if there was one positive touchstone or takeaway uh, from the last 15 months, it's the benefit of having pressed the reset button, having had an opportunity basically to rebuild our market strategy, our go-to-market strategy, our channel mix, our, our, our group to leisure from scratch. Um, you know, on strategy, uh, rebuilding the business, the interflow of everything, um, from brand impressions to the creation of new packages and promotions to channel deployment and management, we, we, we rarely get a chance to sort of redo this. And this, is, this provided a great opportunity for us to try to do that. Now, the forecast algorithms in our respective uh, revenue management portals have been significantly retooled and re-optimized um, to weight the historical data and the pace much lower than we had in the past. I mean, always from a, from a revenue management perspective, we, we looked to the past for some indication and some sort of guidance and some sort of blueprint to see how the future uh, might behave. Um, and that is of very small consideration for the foreseeable future. Um, put more emphasis on forward-looking, uh, such as booking window, such as cancellation, to really determine the behavior of, of the consumer and how business is interflowing. Now, while signs do point to a stabilization, we still are operating with an extremely cautious optimism uh, in this outlook. Instinct in terms of deployment and strategy, um, from my perspective, um, favors a very salient economy and travel industry. And it sort of becomes something, at least in my world, uh, something of a luxury uh, to be able to, 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 to make and prognosticate those decisions more based on, on experience and conjecture than what data was actually telling. Um, my suggestion um, in this case is to set your house up, you know, for success by punctuating those demand drivers, you know, whether there was a, an event that had an undue effect, a positive effect on your occupancy pattern, your cancellations for a certain day. Um, be specific on your recurring and non-recurring events in your market and review your rate tiers as well, um, whether you operate from a bar system or from a price value model. Um, and then let the system work for you. You know, ultimately, one of the things to sort of keep front of mind is that's that's what that's what they do, um, and that is what hotels and resorts pay for. You know, validate recommendations. You know, where and where and when necessary, and do a reality check to be sure. But put the lean on your optimization tool. You know, from a from a from a an AI perspective and also a deep learning perspective, and the forecasting dynamics. The system is is extre Our systems are extremely more intuitive, and I don't want to say prescient. Um, but forward-looking in terms of, of dictating what output and performance is going to look like. Wow. Um, I don't think the last time I met someone, was, we, I, I agreed so much on, on so many points. Thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> um, you mentioned that direct business is... Go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Um, no, you mentioned on the, that the direct business is most profitable. Is there any other chance you could... What type of a business you could you could point out and say, well, this is this is where the hotel's business should be focusing on. Um, we talked about the cost of acquisition, and you know, if we compare trends and leisure uh, bookings um, groups, um, where where do you want to think to just to highlight the draws back and the benefits of each of those segments from cost of acquisition point of view? 
Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I would say that, you know, for, from my from my experience in the discipline, there's been a there's been an active trend um, in the last 10 years, maybe 15 years to evolve the revenue management discipline uh, from strictly rooms profitability to resort and overall profitability. And so that is that has put the pressure on directors of revenue and revenue managers to not so much look at a, a piece of business coming through the door um, as as flowing in the rooms division. How well a piece of, of group business, how well a piece of social catering business, how will a wedding um, affect the spa? How will it affect the outlets if functions are hosted um, in the conference space? Um, the effect of a rooms only group specifically on your outlet revenue, your spa revenue could be of due consideration. So let's start small. Um, a group booking. You know, are you in a position where you're displacing any leisure revenue um, or similarly upsetting uh, your loyal leisure guest base? Have you sold into suite categories that you would use up until that point to really optimize rate, um, even in shoulder periods, um, that would have an effect on your star performance? How does your catering revenue flow? Um, does it flow differently than your outlet revenue does? Now, being mindful, you know, finally of the management of your conference space can really make the difference. You know, to have a tool um, in your RMS that allows you to quote um, a possible group coming into the hotel. The, the, the effect of shifting one day um, later or earlier, adjusting rate up or down can really have a due consideration on whether or not you take it or not. You know, always, always keep in mind the fact that taking a group um, will have, you know, some effect on the resort as a whole um, in each department in, in some way, shape, or form, just based upon the carry cost, right? Again, as I talked about before, if there was a group in-house that um, has hosted functions, it may have an impact on your three-meal restaurant or have an email or a, an impact on your, your coffee shop. Um, so, like everything else, it's a balance. You know, arrival and departure, group ceiling, rate, all, of course, play a part. Transient bookings are a little bit easier to qualify, leisure bookings. Um, and as we talked about before, the holy grail, of course, is the direct bookers. Uh, whether it's a voice booking or brand.com, you have sunk costs, you have opportunity costs that play a part of, of optimizing on those, those channels. Of course, if you have um, travel agent commissions, if you have consortia amenities, if you have wholesale transaction costs or OTA splits, your cost on a leisure booking may approach 30 cents in the dollar. You know, finding that balance and yielding accordingly based upon your, your deployment and your RMS um, can mitigate some of that. Um, and then I'll, I'll end with sort of the, you know, the, 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 the target as, as, as you asked for. And this, this obviously represents a perfect um, scenario. Um, wedding bookings, social catering can be lucrative from a revenue perspective. You know, notwithstanding the, the relative intangibles that, are, that, that come with it, catering revenue flows very well. And whether there is spend on service fees or outside vendors or special special activities, the aggregated spend is outstanding. Needless to say, the wedding bookings are non-recurring, um, and the only theoretical drawback is the impact that you know a wedding booking might have um, on non-participating guests. You know, obviously, from a you know from a channel perspective, this is something that strategists, either on the sales side, on the finance side, and on the revenue side, will look at consistently. Um, I will say that, you know, a budget, especially in this day and age, is, is little more than a first forecast and your ability to sort of change and be as proactive as possible, but get ahead of the trends and deploy accordingly to make sure you're maximizing, again, profitability, not so much just in rooms, but across the board. Guys, we're done. Excellent. And uh, yes, yeah. I think it was great. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks for the interview. Very, very insightful. Olga, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And I'll see you soon, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Now is the moment to introduce the next session. Actually, it's going to be an amazing masterclass with uh, my friend Nia from, from Nova. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Olga. I'll see you thank soon. You thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye-bye.